Good morning, everybody. Uh, we are going to, to start this morning with uh, a very uh, important uh, aspect of um, a few regulation, uh, Brussels 2A, uh, the 1996 uh, A Convention on the Child Protection, and uh, I will uh, uh, say that cooperation, administrative cooperation, cooperation between courts and central authority is very important. And uh, to present this aspect of, of the matter, uh, I'm uh, very glad to present you uh, Miriam Dantin, who is a Belgian judge since 1998. Uh, she specialized in family law and child protection. Uh, she firstly worked as a judge in uh, the Court of First Instance of Brussels and then in the Court of Appeal in Brussels. Uh, through her professional experience, she has, she has always been uh, interested in different judicial and extrajudicial proceedings leading to efficient solution uh, for family conflicts. And considering the fact that she usually had to deal with family cross-border cases, she became a member of the European Judicial Network in Civil and Commercial Matters. And uh, she has been de designated for Belgium as a member of the International Hague Network for Judges. Uh, she regularly take, takes part to training of judges in uh, these matters. Thank you, Florence. I've been um, distributing a paper when you will see the, one of them with this Think pattern is just a help. I, I thought it would be something useful for you when you have to reason uh, about all these technical rules. Just, uh, you know, which is my first question, and then I go yes, no, and then you have this pattern to help you to find out which instrument you have to use and to find out how you have to reason. I'm not going to start again. Maybe I explain it again uh, at the end of the, my lecture, but I don't want to take too much time. This is uh, the stuff of yesterday. This is the lecture of yesterday. It's just a, a, a tool for you. Um, what I'm going, we have spoken about jurisdiction, about applicable law, about recognition and enforcement, about abduction. All these very technical rules are a whole coherent set of rules. This, this is very coherent. Maybe you have noticed that. And I, I want to help you to um, <clears throat> take the position of, in the history, because it's important to understand why and how it's these main in instruments that we have been speaking about have, have been constructed through history. <clears throat> the first one is this convention of 1980. You can imagine this is, this is 40 years ago. So the world is not the same anymore at this moment, okay? This convention was really concentrated on this very specific problem of abductions. Um, and it was a world where we didn't have so many uh, mobility and so many travel and where people were not communicating uh, through the borders, uh, throughout the borders so easily as it is now. So it, it was, the, the aim was to make this specific cooperation system, which is a very specific proceeding through a judicial cooperation and not to, to go further than the diplomatic uh, relations that states can have between each other, to have really this judicial proceedings of return. But imagine it was another world than the world of today. Uh, uh, to 16 years later, we had this Hague Convention of 1996, which is a um, very important um, basis on which this convention of 1980 can stand because without this convention of 96 the convention of 1980 was lacked something uh, they needed uniform jurisdiction rules uh, applicable law rules especially jurisdiction rules jurisdiction rules that will that will make that a, a court will not 
take a case when there is an abduction and, and all those kind of and, and who is who has jurisdiction and it's only f much later that we have this um, European integration with our Brussels uh, to bis regulation after the um, summit of Tempere about which Hervoye spoke us yesterday this very big moment momentum in the European integration where they decided to make a real market, uh, not only a, um, a united market, but a security, how do you call it, uh, area, a, a big area of security and justice. And so from that, from 1999 on, they started making all these regulations that you find in your book that you received yesterday. So Brussels 2 this is one of those. But of course it is, it is, it stands on the, on the other ones. They all have the same basis and goes just a bit further. And then on, next to that you have your national PIL laws, which still remain useful in very little cases, but in these few cases you need it. But ma mainly with countries with whom you don't have this European integration and with whom there is also no Hague Convention, like mostly I speak for Belgium, but African countries and some very remote countries with whom we have this kind of absence of relations that we had in 1980 when the Hague Convention was made for everybody. Okay, So this is, I thought, a uh, chronological and historical um, start of my speech today. Um, I will start also with just a case um, story <laughs> that I can tell you and uh, I made it here on a scheme just because it's important to, to understand and to feel um, how, how things can go wrong if we are not doing it properly. So it goes about an uh, Australian mother and a Belgian father, the first battle which is uh, on top of this uh, line here, is about the first abduction. The residence of the parties with the child was in Belgium. I'm going to very short because I can explain it long, but I don't want to, to take too long time for this. But Okay, the residence was in Belgium. The father was seeking a job in the UK, in London, because he, he, was, he didn't have a job in Belgium, so he was looking around further, so um, for a time the mother and the child stayed in Belgium, but at some stage they, they decided to go to do home sitting in London, just home sitting in, in the sense that they were, um, uh, they, they were going to use the home of friends who were moving for a couple of months to Canada, so this it was not really their home, but they were uh, all there. and. Um, this home setting ended earlier than expected because these friends came back from Canada so that they had to leave uh, and at that stage the mother they all start both father and mother started with different plans the mother wanted to go back to Australia and the father wanted that the family goes back to Belgium and um, at that time there, there is then this abduction case and uh, this divorce they tried first mediation and you have this first seizure of three, three judges are seized. And, uh, I put a number because this is the order. First, the mother seizes the... This? First, a judge is uh, seized with a custody case. Then the father is going to seize a UK judge for a um, return case. And then he seizes also the Belgian judge for divorce and custody. So you have pending uh, this pendants. And there will be a first uh, a battle, I would say, which uh, decides for dismissal of the return case, all about what is the habitual residence of this child. Was it UK or was it Belgium? And the, the UK judges said it is uh, in UK, so there is no wrongful removal. 
and this was confirmed in appeal. And then, some time later, there is an agreement with a judgment on the holiday period in the summer in the UK, and in the custody case. And this judgment says that the child can go to Belgium during the month of August and shall be back on the 8th of September. But the father doesn't bring it back. So this is wrongful removal. And he asked a hearing in this case, which has never gone further. And then the mother goes back to her judge and she gets a first judgment where it is said this child has to return. And then a couple of days later she wants she comes back, she gets an order with the certificate, which will be the basis for this fourth proceeding, which is in Belgium, to put a request of the creation of impossibility of this judgment. This child has to come back. Okay, so we have here in Belgium a, a judge who will um, receive the parties at a hearing on the custody case, and the other judge gets this request. Um, but this judge is going to give just an ex parte judgment, very, very expeditive. The mother is not there at the hearing, and this judge says, okay, father is there, okay, I give him what he wants, sole custody. So we have two contradictory judgments, okay. Ex parte judgment, um, in, in Belgium we call opposition, I don't know how you call that, the, so when the party who was not present can go back to the, to the, ju the same judge. Okay. Mm -hmm. The mother goes in opposition and in the time, uh, the, the next step is here. This judge will make a judgment, he, he sees this, this case coming to him, this request, it's a unilateral <coughs> proceeding, and he says, I have to hear the, the father. Uh, this is not clear for me, and he was suspicious. Uh, and he says, um, I feel this mother is not clear. She wants to go to Australia, and she's not. So he, he was not conf confident about what, what was happening with this request of the mother. So he asks the father to go in the case, so he makes a contradictory proceeding, and he says, okay, I want to ask questions about what is going on in, in England, and I, and he makes a judgment where he say, I, I want to England to tell me this and this and this. And things, the time goes by. Um, when um, this judge receives the parties after the opposition of the mother, they told her, the parties tell this, this judge, Yes, okay, there is a judge, so this judge this discovers that there is a whole story that she didn't have in her picture in her first judgment. She had not in the picture that there was all this stuff, because mother was not uh, present. And this time she is present, she hears about that, and she hears also about the fact that this judge did not give the enforceability that he was considering and taking making all, uh, all kinds of questions about it. And then she decides to stay the proceedings or waiting uh, on what is going to do this judge. And everything has been blocked for months. This child doesn't see her mother anymore because the child is in Belgium and the mother cannot get her judgment enforced. So this is a situation where judges made mistakes. Maybe you see which mistakes there are, but it's a terrible situation. No, everything is blocked. Yes? But isn't it against human rights not to hear the other party in any case, in any such procedure? Does it never happen that you have... Uh, well, uh, it, this, this ex parte judgment, that is because the mother didn't appear. So oh, what she, was do? she was notified. She was notified. Oh, okay. Well, she was notified. I don't know. She's notified. Of she, I'm not sure this judge was very, uh, you know, because the was, uh, the was very, you. very clear about it's that. Against the law, she's not notified. Well, she she probably hasn't been okay. notified, okay. but she was not there. Okay. And this is first a unilateral procedure. Mm -hmm. That's in the law. That's in the Brussels to this. So I leave it now for what it is, and we come back to it later. Uh, I will give you how it ended up, okay, later. And further speech.
what I want to speak to you about is the oil in the wheels, the oil in the machinery, because all these technical rules is are difficult when you when you don't make them live with who with uh, we judges we judges are the oil but we have to make it turn around and we have to make this picture big and not small as this judge did just had a very small picture of the, the case we have to make it big we have to know the whole story and um Essential, essential in this is the co cooperation. You have already understood what is the aim of my speech of today. Uh, and my challenge is to recondition you, to, to make you say, lose your reflexes and your habits of civil law judges, because common law judges don't have this problem, but civil law judges, as we are from the continent, I don't like, think we have UK judges here. Uh, we have this reflex of we know what we, 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 what we get to know in the hearing, but to, that's all we do, and we cannot do anything else. We just have to do with what we get. Well, there is very little legislation and very little uh, text about how we can do our oil machinery, but we have to be, to be creative. And this is a, the, the, the challenge is to make these European rules life uh, efficient, <coughs> otherwise it will not work. Even if there is no national law about how you do when you want to communicate outside of your court, you have to be creative and authorize yourself and allow yourself. Overtake this need that we have all to have rules to tell us how to do and just experiment so that's what I'm going to spoke about to speak about today, and therefore I want to focus on several situations. So it's a mixture of what we heard yesterday. Yesterday you had very structured um, lectures with one step, second step, third step. Today I mix everything, and I will try to review some things that we have seen, but specifically to focus on the situations where more judges are involved in the same case. Okay, So you see them listed here. The first situation, at the dispendants. The second is provisional measures, transfer of the case, the wrongful removal, the abduction cases, the recognition problematics, the placement of children in another member states, the taking of evidence. All these situations, we are in a bigger picture. Okay. So my first focus on dispendants, a uh, quick recall of, this, of the rules, Article 19. You will see that I every time put your, the article in Brussels 2A and the parallel article in the Convention of 1996, because as I explained to you, both texts are not identical. There are differences, but mainly they are in the same structure, at least when I speak about jurisdiction matters because applicable law is not in Brussels 2A, okay? Only jurisdiction on the jurisdiction chapter of 1996, Hague Convention, is really parallel. You find the same ideas than in Brussels 2A. So, therefore, I made the slides that you can find back the, the mm -hmm. correspondent articles, okay? The rule for less pendants, you have already understood that. First, seized. Um, well, when is there a dispendence? This is the first point. When it's about the same child and the same cause, but not necessarily the same parties. So you can have uh, a case on the parental responsibility that is um, that concerns grandparents and the child, and another case that concerns parents and the child, or maybe an institution uh, for placement of the child, and another case with the parents. This is the same cause, okay? So it's a bit wider than the narrow idea about this dependence. When you have this dependence situation, the rule is that the first court, which is first seized, seized, has to decide about its jurisdiction while the other stays the proceedings. Bye bye, Martina. Have a good Hi. travel home. Thank you. See you have later. Fun. <laughs> nice meeting you. And only when the first judge has uh, 
either established its jurisdiction, the other one will just let it go and not go further and just um, uh, decline. That's the word that it's used in, in the article, decline its jurisdiction. But if the first C says, no, I have no jurisdiction, then the second C can go ahead and control whether he has jurisdiction. Okay? This is the rule for dependence. Another focus is the one on provisional measures. Look, you have provisional measures in one state because a child is present in that state. I give a, a very easy example. There is a road accident. The child is involved in a road accident. The, the parents are, uh, are also uh, not in a position to take care of the child. They are maybe dead in the road accident. Okay, the child has to be taken in a, in a immediately in a protective manner, matter, uh, protective measure, but um, it's not the habitual residence there. So that's a provisional me measure, and it's uh, interesting that this provisional measure, this information can go to maybe the judge of the habitual residence. So we, ha we can have different situations, uh, different judges seized on the same case, you have to know, we spoke about that yesterday, I think, um, that there is a different difference between the Hague Convention of 96 about urgent matters uh, compared as the urgent measures in Brussels 2A, in the sense that the, the urgent matters in Brussels 2A are not, have no extraterritorial effect. That means you cannot enforce them in the other state. Um, but this will change with the, the recast of Brussels 2A. A third situation uh, I want you to focus on is this Article 15, which you have equivalent articles in the Convention of 1996. This is this possibility to transfer the case to another better place. What is the rule? Um, just to recall it, the, it's an exceptional uh, situation, so you, you cannot do that just for the fun. Okay, It must be really an exceptional situation. Um, and it is this idea of the forum more convenience, this is a common law concept, is the court which is better placed under your appreciation, <coughs> always thinking about the interest of the child. First you have to check whether you have jurisdiction. If you don't have jurisdiction, you cannot transfer the case. Okay? It's, only, it's a transfer of jurisdiction, so you first have to have it. It's the first step control whether you have it under Brussels 2A or under the convention. There must be a special connection between the child and this other country where you want to send the jurisdiction. And these examples of special connections are in Article 15, so I'm not going to review all the article. You can read, you are all, uh, it's, this is not an academic lecture with uh, every point, but you just look what are the particular connections, like for, for instance that the child has moved in the meantime between the moment that you, the, you, you were seized and the moment that you have to make a decision. Uh, this is uh, one example. Uh, and you, uh, according to your appreciation, another member state is better, better placed to hear the case um, and you think that this transfer is in the interest of the child. All these conditions have to be um, present. And what are you doing then? On your own motion, because you had this idea, or because a party asks you, or because a judge from another mo member state gives you, suggests you, or asks you to do it. So there can be different situations. But in any case, you need the acceptance of at least one party. Um, and what are you going to do? There are two options. We had yesterday a colleague who spoke about her experience with pain. She said she used the, f the first option, which is to stay the case and to ask the parties to introduce a, a request before the other court. The other option is to have yourself a request to the court. So you see, we have, have to communicate. And this is this, so the, this uh, exchange of views between two courts. This other court will have to answer the request, and it 
gets there for under Brussels 2A, there is a delay of, uh, or not a delay, a time limit of six weeks that it receives to, to answer. The text doesn't say how this happens. Is this through judgments? Is this just uh, email correspondence? Does this judge in this other member state have to make a hearing to hear the parties before or not? It's, it's a bit um, search, experiment. You try, you do as you think you can do, what is the best according to your procedural laws and procedural situation and but we have to be creative because it's not really written in the text and my, mainly at least in belgium we don't have a, a national text to say how we have to do it okay uh, so two options either this other judge accepts and then you can decline in favor of this um, judge or this court refuses or does not answer, and in that case you just continue and you exercise your own jurisdiction. So you never, it's, it's a, a, a play of ball, you send the ball, but you are not going away, you're still there, you just, you do this, because we have seen that as well, that a judge says, I think this is a better place, judge, uh, send the case, and then you close, you're fine and you finish with a final judgment saying I transfer the case. That's not, that's not the way it goes. Of course, you first have to ask, you keep your file open, you make a, you, you, you postpose, you make a, you schedule a new hearing in order to see with the parties what will have been the, the answer. And then you wait for the answer, you see the parties again. If the answer is yes, then you close your file and you make a final decision where you transfer the jurisdiction. You see how it works. It's really a ping pong play. I would say uh, be careful. This is not a rule which is made to circumvene or to go around the, the rules on jurisdiction when you have an abduction. Because of course, then you, you you collapse all the system. When there is an abduction, the idea is that even though the child may have been there for a couple of months in this other state, and even has acquired a habitual residence there, and then you say, okay, but now I think this other state is better placed. I send it over. Okay, it can happen. The text doesn't say that you cannot do it, but it's not really coherent with the whole system. Okay. Then focus on another situation where you have this um, combination of different uh, judges, and these are our famous abduction cases. What is an abduction? On this slide, I explain you um, where you can find this definition on abduction. The central idea is, of course, the right of custody, which are violated by the removal of a child. R wrongful removal or retention, okay? <laughs> so you, you, the parent, the abducting parent goes away with the child or doesn't come back after a holiday period. So it's both, both are uh, called abductions. Um, in order to examine whether or not there is a wrongful removal or, non or retention of the child, you have first to, uh, to examine who has custody rights. If there is no custody rights, for instance, for the father, in several of our systems, fathers who are not married with the mother don't have parental rights when the child is born. You have to, you have that in the Netherlands, in Germany, in Ireland. So there are, this, this is not in Belgium, so we are not used to that for Belgium. At, from the moment that a father has his um, father uh, link established, he has parental responsibility out of law. The law makes that. But in other countries, they have to go to court for to, or I don't know what to do, maybe to an administrative authority, but they have to get it. So it, it may be that <coughs> there is no wrongful removal if this father hasn't, has not done this step. So really you have to look at that. And how are you look, looking at that? to know whether there is wrongful removal, <coughs> look at the, the, the law of the habitual residence of the child. And this is a 
rule, which you find not in Brussels 2A, but in the Convention of 1996, because Brussels 2A doesn't speak about applicable law. Okay? <coughs> what is the basic rule in cases of abduction? All the system lights on that is that the even though the child may acquire a new habitual residence in a place where she has been, he has been removed, even though this habitual residence will be established in another country, the jurisdiction will not go over. In a normal situation, as soon as the child acquires a new habitual residence, the jurisdiction moves, goes to the new state. And when it is a wrongful removal, it does not go over. And that means that the court of the previous habitual residence retains his jurisdiction and the court of the place where the child is and has maybe, an, in the meantime, acquired a habitual residence. Because habitual residence is a factual notion, so it, can, it, it is independent from, the, from all this legal stuff. The, the, the idea of habitual residence is just factual. Are there ma main connections, the, 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 the sustainable uh, connections of this child, ch school, uh, doctor, family life, everything is in this state, that's habitual residence. So that can happen that even in the abduction case, this habitual residence goes over, but it has no legal consequence on jurisdiction, at least during one year. So that's Article T 10, and you will, you will read that article very closely. It's a long, long article. But in any case, during this period, the court where the child is or has acquired a new habitual residence cannot take jurisdiction on the merits, on the substance. It can take urgent situations if there is, for instance, a threat of new counter abduction. That can happen also. Or if uh, this abducting parent is not adequate for the child and there must be a measure or whatever, or maybe a measure to grant visitation rights or access rights to the left behind parents during the time that the judge's return judge or the, or the custody judge takes a decision. Might be you can organize maybe an access an afternoon in a, uh, uh, a safe place to, so, this judge in the place uh, of the, in the place where the child is can take provisional and urgent matters, but that's all he can do. About the return proceeding, you have heard uh, also yesterday. There are, in principle, it has to be a return. When the, first you have to assess whether it is wrongful or not, whether it is an abduction or not. I told you before. And when it is an abduction, then you have to order this return and you have very uh, restrictive exceptions. Which are these exceptions? These are in Article 13, little a, when there was no actual exercise of the custody by the left behind parent, but this is very close to the definition of uh, abduction, so it's not really an exception or when there is a subsequent acquiescement or consentment. Mainly, people will argue on B, on the little b, a grave, the existence of a grave risk of physical or psychological harm of, or an interval situation that will be, of course, the main, of our, the, the, the main category of our uh, litigation on this point, because you ha will have this abducting parent who, who will argue that uh, there is a terrible situation for this child and you cannot uh, send him back because that will uh, be uh, too, too heavy for him, too, too, too tra traumatic, for, uh, all kinds of uh, reasons. You have also the objection of the child, when the, and you can take this in consideration when you think that he has an age which, is, which shows uh, that you have to take this into account. And then Article 20 is also one possibility, but this is a very extreme situation when you <coughs> think that it will be contrary to the fundamental principles of, <coughs> of your state. You can refuse it, but of course you cannot use this as a, 
as, a, as an argument to say, no, this is, I will not do it. Uh, because we are all countries, the contracting parties to this convention are supposed to be all in the same um, mood, uh, the same um, motivation to protect the children's rights. So, okay. Then you know that on top of this Hague Convention, we have Brussels 2A, which completes it, to, so it doesn't, it's not next to it, it's just on top of it, it makes it even hard, harder with this Article 11. Uh, why is that? Because this Article 11 says, first, you must hear the child. Of course, it says also, unless it is inappropriate according to his age or maturity. But so this hearing of the child is recalled in this article. Secondly, you must act expeditiously. You get a six weeks period to give a decision. And it's no way to wait for months and months before this return order is given. It must be quick, otherwise you have all this more and more traumatic situation where you have to send a child back. Um, if you want to refuse if you feel that you are in a situation where you're going to refuse uh, this return, you have to previously contact the judge of the other of the member state of origin to ask what they can do to protect the child. Because the idea is you have to return and you have to be confident and to trust that the country of origin will be able to do all what is necessary to protect the child. So don't think that you are a better protector of the child than the, the judge who is from the origin, original state. And so you have to contact this judge. And if you don't get an answer or you get an unsatisfactory answer, then you can decide to return the child. But still, if you do refuse to return the child, what will happen? The file, it's not the last word, the file goes back to the, to the judge from the first, from the original country and you have this second chance proceeding, the overriding proceeding that we've also speaking, spoken about yesterday, where there will be a final decision. So even though you think there is no, it, it's a situation of not to return the child, it's not your last word. The, another it's kind of an appeal will happen in the other state, in the state of origin. But this is only in the European community that we have this, okay? <coughs> if it's outside, if the, if the child com comes from outside, or, or if it's uh, abducted to outside of Europe, we don't have this specific mechanism. But you see how important it is to cooperate. Um, now another, another situation is this recognition situation, enforcement situations. Uh, we have this in my example here with the, the Belgian uh, judge who is seized of a declaration of enforceability. What are the rules? And how did he wrong? It was quite wrong. So for the recognition, we heard there is no proceeding necessary. For the enforcement, you have this direct enforcement in two situations that Martina explained yesterday. There are um, the certificates of Article 41 and 42. 41 is when it's a judgment about access rights, and 42 it is when this is this overriding decision which makes which orders the return by the judge of the original state, of the state of origin. These two situations will have a direct enforceability and the parent who has, who possesses this um, judgment will not need to go to another judge, he can enforce it immediately. In all the other situations, it's an east procedure, it's not an ex equato like we know them in classical civil matters. It's an East procedure which is unilateral, so you just have to go with your judgment to this judge to get this declaration of enforceability. I imagine this is just like getting a stamp, you know, okay, this is a European judgment, I give you the stamp and it's okay. It's like, you can imagine it like that. It's, it's not, the idea is not to make a whole debate on it. 
<coughs> so you understand that this judge is a bit too suspicious. He has to recognize this um, British uh, judgment and not to be that suspicious about what's behind it and what what is this mother in his head and her, in her head. He has to to say, okay, there is here a British judgment. I have to just verify which are the very restricted refusal grounds. Uh, I say it's unilateral, but it, an appeal is possible. So it can become, when in appeal, it can, becomes a contradictory proceeding. And it has to be given without delay. And which are the exceptional uh, refusal grounds? <laughs> Uh, the ground that you find in all regulations, European regulation, which is the public order, the absence of the hearing of the child. So be aware the hearing of the child is fundamental, or at least you have to write why you don't do it, whether or not uh, you, you are going to, to hear the child because it's too small or uh, this kind of thing, stuff. Um, you have to, well, if, if the uh, one party, and there we can um, uh, link to the link with the colleague who said that it was n not okay when one party is not heard, indeed, here you can refuse the recognition of the, the enforcement, the declaration of enforceability if the other party has not had the possibility to be heard. Um, when there is uh, a default, an ex parte situation, you, ha you can control whether this person has received, not been notified of the, the documents, have been served the documents on the uh, proper way according to the European regulation on service of documents or the Hague Convention on service of documents. So this is a control that you can do. Uh, also when <coughs> There is a judgment, a later judgment of your own system, of your own country, which is country irreconcilable, irreconcilable, uh, which is contrary to this judgment that one asks you to recognize or to enforce. Okay, so for instance, this judge. Um, from the moment that he knows that there is a ju an ex parte judgment from Belgium which gives all the rights to this father, he can refuse the request. And that's what he did afterwards, but I'll tell you that later. Uh, also when the procedure under Article 56 was not uh, respected. So these are the refusal grounds and no other, of course, no control of the jurisdiction rules, even though the judge who made a judgment that you are uh, asked to enforce who had no jurisdiction and you think this is really a obvious violation of our rules or your European rules and your heart is beating from oh, this is terrible, these judges who cannot understand how works process 2A, you still have to enforce it and to recognize. Okay? So whatever your emotions are about this judgment, don't review it on the substance and don't review it on the jurisdiction. Um, <clears throat> a slide on the certificates, just to remember also uh, to deliver ex officio when it is a situation of right of access or of return of the child after the second challenge procedure and the certificate to deliver uh, only on request of a party when it is for the other matters, matrimonial matters and responsibility matters, you'll see that this is Annex 1 and Annex 2 to Brussels 2A, while the two others are Annex 3 and Annex 4. Okay, uh, So matrimonial matters is Annex 1, so for divorce, uh, uh, parent responsibility is Annex 2. Okay. Um, Focus now on another situation is the placement of a child abroad. If you consider to put a child in a foster family in another member state or an institutional placement, you also have under both instruments, Brussels 2A and the Convention, you have an article that explains how you have to work. 
Okay, you cannot do that just straightforward without taking a picture, bigger picture, and taking an account that there are other judges in another member state. You have to follow this um, proceedings through cooperation, mainly, I would say here, mainly through central authority. You can also be in a situation where you want to get evidence abroad. Uh, there is no judge seized, no other judge seized, but you still need social report or an expertise. It may be, for instance, that you think that you have jurisdiction on basis of Article 12. Article 12, if you remain, remind, is this article um, under Brussels 2A, which makes it possible when parties agree that uh, the judge, which is not the judge of the habitual residence of the child, but which is a judge who, is, uh, who has jurisdiction on divorce, or even if there is no divorce proceedings, uh, when there is a specific connection with the child, for instance, that one of the parents live in this country, when there is agreement that you have to assess an ex explicit agreement of the parents, you can take your jurisdiction. So it's an exception on this famous rule of Article 8, which has only the jurisdiction of the habitual residence. So it can happen that you, as a judge, you, you will take a decision which is about a child who is not living in your country. And maybe you will want to have some, some report. Okay, what are you doing? Again, we have rules for that. We have this council regula um, EU, EU regulation on taking evidence. And we have this article in Brussels 2A, which uh, gives uh, the mission to the central authorities to help also on that point. Okay, so maybe you feel like that, and you think this is all too difficult for you. And you have all these terms, network, liaison, central authorities, um, judicial communication, what are you going to do with all that? Contact points. So I'll try now to put everything in its place and to make it clear for you what you can do and what you cannot do, or where you can go. <laughs> um, when we speak about this cross-border litigation, we have to pay honor to whom honor is due and these are the central authorities. These are the institutions that you have in every state, which are the central uh, of this motor of the, which, which are the motor of the uh, cross-border cooperation in child protection matters. Um, I'm thinking we have here. I, I put a lot. Yeah. The central authorities have general functions. If you read these articles, you will find this, uh, the description of these uh, general functions, which are mainly about giving information about legislation, about the procedures, about available services to protect children. And they, have, they are there for everyone. They are there for the people, for the uh, 
parents, for the children, for the judges and the professionals as well. They can answer Merci. to everybody. And then they have missions in specific matters, which are, um, of course, this famous wrongful removal and the introduction of the return orders, because um, you've seen that in this convention of 1980, that the return proceedings start from from the, the central authorities, uh, the, the, the father, the, the uh, parent who is left behind goes to his central authority who will put a request to the central authority of the place where the child might be, should be, maybe we, so we start not knowing where the child is, but we suppose it is in that other country, mm -hmm. and then the central authority will mm -hmm. try to locate the child, will, have, will take the help with police services and whatever to find where is the child, and then may start a return proceeding in that state. So there the central authorities are really a key, have a key role. But they can also intervene in the placement of children abroad, in the situations of transfer of jurisdiction uh, to a court better placed, that we've spoken about. They can organize cross-border mediation. They are very much a motor for this kind of things as well. Um, they have also a mission on the enforcement of access rights. And within all these missions, they say, it's said that they have to facilitate communications between courts. So you see, we have in this text the idea of communications between courts. So it's not only courts with central authorities, but also courts to courts. And in particular, it says in Article 55, it is said in particular for the uh, 11, Article 11.6.7, this is this overriding proceeding, or in, uh, also about Article 15, which is this transfer between, uh, transfer between cases between courts. But then we have this judicial cooperation which goes next to the cooperation with the central authorities because all these instruments have really created the need first to liaison, to re liaise between the, the judges, to have this possibility to have court-to-court -court contact, judge-to-judge -judge contact, which we call direct judicial ju communications, but also a need for help, kind of a help desk for assistance to the judges. And yes, this direct judicial communications come, goes back to 1996 when a first communication took place. Uh, it was between Canada and uh, Quebec and California. And it was in an abduction case, this, this judge who wanted to return the mother and the child, the, the child of course, but the mother was going with the child, and wondered whether this mother would be um, subject to criminal proceedings in the state of California. So this kind of questions, just to know what's going to happen, what's possible, what's not possible, what are the, the kinds of laws that you have in the country where you have to return a child. This was the first idea. I'm not saying that you have to do this kind of communication, but it's just to, to show you that common law judges don't have this problem. They just take their telephone and they speak. They have, of course, a common language, which makes it much easier, but it's also their, their, their way of thinking, which is, I know, their format is different as ours. But we are asked to do a bit like them, in respect of our laws, of course. Uh, I would say, Judges prefer to speak with judges than with central authorities. It's not the same language. It's not the same, I'm not speaking here about a national language, but it's not the same way of thinking that we have. So when you have a judge uh, as a respondent, you really feel that there is something in common. We have all, family judges specifically have all the same, you know, motivations to find a good way to protect the children. I'm not saying that central authorities are not doing that. It's just they are civil servants. They have another way of, of working. So it's it's nice to have this confidence to grow also the, the mutual trust, to have this flexibility, this informali informality. What can I say? Yeah. The swiftness, the efficiency of speaking the same 
to a same pro a professional which does the same as you. On this slide, I can I make a, again a list of situations. Uh, we have already spoken about these situations to make a contextual uh, a context of, of the, the country where you want to return a child when it is an abduction case, but also transfer to a court, uh, placement of a child. Other situations are the transmission of information. Um, there is a child that you have made, you, you ordered a guardian to a child, and this child at some stage is going to move. You want to announce this to a judge to be sure that this, another judge will follow up the situation. It can be a lot of different situations. So what has been built in behind all that? These are these networks. And the, on this uh, slide, you see about this European judicial network in civil and commercial matters. We had her lawyer yesterday, who is um, presently the person who rules this network. Um, this network is co is composed with is, first, is has been created by a council decision in 2001, if I recall. Yeah. And uh, it is quite a, a big thing. Okay, we have these meetings uh, once one, one uh, once a year. We have an annual meeting, and then we have meetings all over the the year, uh, which are more specific on a team, on a specific regulation, on a family, or on the um, um, service of, of document service of documents, taking uh, evidence, or different topics are in the uh, different meetings. And it's, uh, it's when I say it's a big thing because in, you have all these delegations um, of every uh, member state, which are composed of ma mainly the central authorities, but also the contact. <coughs> I, I will say mainly the contact points. This is the first thing: it's a contact point in every state, some, sometimes two. Central authorities are part of them. Then you have liaison magistrates. I don't know exactly what this goes for, but then this point D, <coughs> they say any other judicial authority or administrative authority, and there you can find judges. So <coughs> we, um, Anne, who is here, and myself, we are members of the Belgian part of this, but we are not the contact points, you see, we are just judicial members of our, um, of the EGN. Uh, and now it is also open to other professions like uh, lawyers, notaries, uh, clerks, bailiffs. So, um, which makes that it, it's become really a, a big thing. It's quite bureaucratic, but it is conceived as being a flexible network which brings together all the national judicial authorities. And it aims to strengthen the judicial cooperation between the member states and improve the practical implementation and application of EU civil justice instruments. Okay, you have here the different missions. Facilitate judicial cooperation is one of the missions. Um, how, by cooperation in cross-border cases, we have in these big meeting, meetings also what they call bilaterals bilateral meetings, so this is, uh, we get all together in one place and then you have the central authorities who have different files and cases that they have to discuss and so they can face to face find a person of the other country to speak about because when things all go, always go on the telephone of, or on the mails, it might be more difficult. Once you, you are together around the table, it is really efficient. Uh, and then there is this website. I'm going to show you the website because it's a it's a treasure of information. Okay. <laughs> you go to the portal of e, e C just uh, just e, e Justice Europe Europe and you find you fall here. Okay, you have here a, a number of things. For instance, European tradition that you about the network, here you have a little uh, 
film with what is explanation of it. Okay. You have judges. Look at that. This is for you, judges. You click here and you find your own contact point. You have to know who is the contact point of your excuse me. Thank you. Uh, so I was saying that you, via this website, you find your your own contact point. So which is your country, for instance? Which Portugal? Okay, Portugal. You find Portugal. Ah, yeah, that will be a problem here. I'll put mine because you have to to have an official address. Only a. a not Gmail or this kind of thing, but I put Belgium. My name is not important, but my my official address. And then you will see that you have this name that appears. Sorry, at home it worked. <laughs> this is pity. It should work. Maybe you try. You you should try with your own address. Um, okay, let's go back. I don't want to go back. Um, then another thing which is very interesting is the publications. You have here all these practice guides that the uh, ECG made on the different um, regulations that you have in your book. And specifically, you have the practice guide on Brussels 2, Brussels 2A here. This is a very precious document. I think uh, Sarah put it on the documentation of this seminar. Uh, where does this, this, uh, maybe this is the system here which doesn't work. Okay, look, it's open. Ah, here, look, it's here. Okay. Um. Now, back here. Uh, the compendium that you have on your table is here. <coughs> but I'm going to open it now. What else uh, can you find here? Oh yes, the information sheets. We go back uh, here. You have information, and this is very precious because yesterday I don't re Maria uh, said, uh, "Good luck for this French judge to apply Polish law." You remember? Indeed, it is sometimes very difficult to know what is foreign law. Well, you have this... Uh, where am I? Here. Information on national law. You have a, a, a whole range of topics. For instance, you want to know about divorce in Poland. You go here, and then you find 
all the countries are here, and this is in all the Euro European languages of all, you have these sheets in all languages, so whatever language you use, this is English, but you can work, uh, ever find everything in your language as well. Poland, where is it? Poland. And you have this information about divorce in Poland with a lot of questions and the link to uh, every question brings you to answers. So this is a very precious tool for us to have a first, of course it's, it may not be always up to date or always completely exact. It, it's of course the purpose that the tool is, is useful, but uh, if you want to really have a a uh, case law, a very specific case law, you might not find it here, but a general view on the uh, foreign uh, law is, uh, a very, is, is possible. And then you have here on the back, on the, on the down, the European Judicial Atlas. And in the atlas you find all the different um, regulations back. If we take our regulation process 2A, you find the text, but you find also the forms. Re recall, remember you, you have all these certificates that you have to fill out. You find them here, you can download them, you can fill them out online. Article 39, the two different Article 39, uh, and then the Article 41, 42. Okay. I download it in English, for instance. It's here. And you can fill out it. Okay? Since there is one more thing that I wanted to show you, but I lost it. Okay, um, e justice. In the atlas. Uh, back to our Brussels 2A. Oh, this is in French. In English, here. You want to find a competent court. You select, for instance, I'll do it with Belgium because I know better. <laughs> Proceed. So, family law, I want to find a court in Belgium. Proceed. Please select. I can find my central authority here as well. Proceed. And you have here the, the address of the Belgian Central Authority, okay, in French and in Dutch. Uh, if I want to uh, find not a Central Authority but a court for recognition, proceed. And then they ask you the city. Okay, let's say Namur. Proceed, and you have the address. You see how easy it is. I mean, easy uh, when you're used to it, it becomes easy. But you can really find all the addresses in here. This is a very good tool. I would say this is a, the, the most important achievement of um, this your, your ECG. But then further, let's start back in my PowerPoint. Um, we have then this other network, this other network which is in the frame, which is built in the frame of the conference, the Hague Conference of um, Private International Law, which is called the International Hague Network of Judges. Um, this is a whole other thing. As you have understood, this European uh, network has been built from the top. Commission made a decision to make this network and it was 
made on, on the basis of a text, a legal text, and, and it works from, it's quite a bureaucratic thing. While this is something which is created from the bottom. It's, it comes from the idea that judges uh, found, uh, that judges that came up on a conference in 1998, that there should be a network of judges. It was not in a European context. It was an international context under the Hague. Uh, it was a conference in, um, uh, organized by the, the Permanent Bureau. And these judges have decided to, to make it just from the, from the bottom. And, and it's, it's an initiative. It's, there's no text about it. Okay? There are only sitting judges with expertise in family law litigation and uh, by now, so we say uh, 20 years later, we have 130 judges out of 40, 84 states, different states. And again, we have a list, and I would like you to look at this list. Whom of you knows who is his international hate judge of his country? Show me. You have never heard about your judge in, the, in your country? You don't know who it is? Okay. You know who it is? Okay. So we're going to look at that, but I have to uh, control the time. How much time do I have to look? We're going back. Back to internet, and we take again the H C C H H C C H. So this that's the. Net, the website of the Hague Convention. We put it in English. We can go to our... We go to the Convention of 1980, for instance, because this is the main convention. Originally, this network was meant to work for these abduction cases and this specific convention, but 20 years later we see that we can use it to, for many other instruments and, and situations. And you have here all the documents that, uh, that are related to this convention, and you have the International Hague Network of Judges. You can find the members. On this list you have the names without the names without the Oops. Uh, the contacts, because this is a, is a public website and uh, the idea is now that everybody can uh, reach uh, these judges. So, please, who wants to know who is this judge? Martina. Yeah. Martina and uh, I don't know whether the, uh, there are there are two of them in Germany. Martina and oh yeah, the, the new judge is put on that. It was Sabine in Berlin, but now she is retired. And the new new judge is Joanna Goodsight. Who else wants? Spain. Greece. Uh, Greece. Uh, well, Greece doesn't have one. So maybe you are the, 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 the perfect. What is your question? <laughs> well, you you should find a judge who is who can uh, candidate for this job. That is the first thing. Last year, this seminar took place in Thessaloniki, and it was already uh, the, con the we we heard that there was no judge in Greece. So I told it to the judges who were present. Please find one expert judge to 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 join because this is very important. Portugal. Portugal. Uh, first, Italy. Uh, Italy, yes, there is one for Italy. Um, Gabriela Tomai, Daniela Bacchetta. Portugal? Portugal? Uh, 
So, but um, I, I will give you, now I don't want to be too long, but I have the list with the contacts. So please, we are going. So you, you find on your table, I distributed a page with all your contacts. And I want you not to leave the room today without having put down the name of your contact point of EGN, of your judge of the international network, and of your central authority. You've seen how we can find it. So we, during the coffee time or during the lunch time, we can go. Uh, those of, who, of you who have a laptop, uh, you know, you can get on internet. Uh, this is the password if, if some of you want. So I think uh, all of you can find for yourself and go home with your little paper with all the names, okay? In a way, you need uh, an experienced judge who wants to transmit his experience. So for those countries who do not have a judge yet, um, you can start thinking about that. Maybe you know or you are yourself uh, willing to do that. Um, a judge who, who is pragmatic and who has common sense and who can help his uh, colleagues. So just this slide explains again that this, um, this network was created out of judicial activism. There were some judges, uh, I pay honor to Lord Matthew Thorpe, who is a UK judge, now retired, but he was one of these mortars and he went all over the world knocking at the doors of the governments and of the judiciaries saying we need a judge get in this country, in this network, because this is the only way to make, to give uh, real reality to these international instruments and to make the picture big, and to get the, the local judges who are in charge of it, all these very dramatic cases, to get them in a possibility to make the picture big and to understand what is happening in the other countries. Um, and I, I suppose we are quite um, pioneers in, in this kind of um, uh, activism because children are so closely to the heart of everybody and the urgency of the situations that we have to deal with make that there is like something that, that makes you do more than necessary. You see? Mm -hmm. I, I think we all have that as family judges, this kind of passion for doing a, giving a solution to these families who are living in very difficult situations and, and these children who are fetched in, in these battles. So um, I think those judges are not judges nine to five, just working, uh, doing their job and then going home. It, it's just, I, that's, the, that's the reason I suppose that we could realize such an achievement of making this, this network. Um, of course, there are reactances, and we have to hear them. And it uh, concerns mainly the absence of legal basis. We don't have in our text what to do with this. And uh, we might say, oh, this is not constitutional. This is, not, this is against my procedural law. This is against my independence. But the big advantage, advantage is this informality and this flexibility and with our emails and uh, the, the current uh, communication tools that the world has developed with internet, it is so easy to get very quick responses. And to, um, to try to, to give an answer to these um, objections and the difficulties that we have to to live with that, to, to make these uh, communications. 
the international, the Hague, the Hague Convention, the Permanent Bureau made with uh, some expert judges, members of this uh, network, this uh, document. You gave, you have it also in your. Or I asked uh, already Sarah to send it to you to in your um, in your documentation, but you can also find it on the website of the uh, international um, Hague Convention. HCCH. Um, this is a, a document which is called Emergent, Emerging Guidelines Regarding the Development of the Hague Network and General Principles of Direct Judicial Communications, including Commonly Accepted Safeguards. So you see, we try through this document, it is um, soft law, of course, it's not a convention, but it is an indication and it should be what widely distributed, because it is kind of a, um, a thing to stand upon to do this. What is another achievement of this permanent bureau and the Hague Network is the judge's newsletter. Maybe you've heard about that, maybe you want to receive that. It's not a problem, you just ask your network judge to receive the, Hague, Hague, the judge's newsletter. It, is, it, it used to be in a paper format, but now they only make it in an uh, internet uh, electronic format anymore. So it's very easy, you, are just, you just ask and you will receive it. Uh, you also can download them from the uh, website of HTCH. Uh, and a very precious do uh, edition on specific themes as judicial communication, abduction, hearing of the child, uh, you have the reports of different um, uh, conferences and uh, commissions and that kind of thing. Another achievement or that you have to know is this uh, database, INCADAT. Uh, this is the leading legal database on international child abduction. So if you find, if you are looking for some case law, specific case law from all over the world on this abduction cases, you'll find that on that uh, link that I give you here in Canada. Also via the website of HACCH, you can find it. On this slide, you find a kind of a visual summary of what I've been explaining about these two networks. You have uh, this European network, which is larger on relating to the matters, because it's all civil and commercial matters, but it's smaller because it's only Europe. And then you have this international Hague network, which is larger because it's whole world, but it's only family matters. So that's why I, I put it with two circles with a part which is common. And of course, this common part, it is, we try to have the members of the European network, which are the same as the members of the international network, so that it doesn't make competition between both networks. It's, they are just next to each other, they have maybe uh, other advantages for the one or for the other, but the, the idea is not to, to say one is better than the other. It's just um, I will say the EGN is more focused on central authorities and um, now judges do take more importance since the revision, but it's still very bureaucratic. And the EHNG, International Hague Network, is more informal, it's judge to judge. And uh, you don't have, it's a problem for some, I wouldn't say that we in Belgium, we have such a problem in contacting our central authority. There is, there is no big, difficulty about the independence of the judiciary. But there are countries where really they cannot imagine to contact an executive uh, organ, which is central authority, because of the separation of the different powers. Judiciary will always remain within the judiciary and they cannot contact a governmental uh, organ. That's why it's necessary to have this contact through judges to avoid passing through central authorities being a judge and leaving central authorities to their job, their first job is helping people, helping also maybe prosecutors, but the judges remain amongst them. 
Okay, here again we have this print, the guidelines, the general principles. Uh, I always also uh, put you some um, references to uh, to lecture, to to interesting uh, things to read, readings on the topic. And I just want to uh, go through very quickly different the different uh, chapters of this little brochure. It is made in three parts. You have a first part which is um, which re regards the development of the international network, how these judges are selected, and again that is dependent on every every state. There is no rule; it's not written anywhere. But some in some states you have a judiciary uh, body which is appointed officially a network judge. Others it is the Minister of Justice, or it can be other all all kinds of things. But you don't have to wait for this uh, top bodies to decide something. You have to go and, and say, okay, let's appoint somebody and let, let's do it like that. So it explains about a bit how this network was built uh, from through the years. A second chapter is about the general principle, no, the principle of general communications, when you have just to communicate on general matters. And then the third chapter is on specific, when we communicate on specific cases. So this first chapter, you have the way the judges are appointing, appointed. It should be sitting judges with authority and present experience in that area. And then you have also uh, the process of the designation of the network judges, as I told you. The second chapter on general judicial communications, you have the internal communication within your domestic court system. And so the Hague judge can be there for to assure the distribution of the judge's newsletter, uh, to give information about trainings, about international family matters. You have internally relationships with the central authority. Again, it's not the idea to have a comp uh, to be in competition with central authority. The best is to have a very good relation, to be complementary with the central authority, to create a mutual trust, trust and confidence, to participate to common meetings and to exchange ideas. And the third uh, part speaks about the international communications that we can have on general matters, like uh, encourage each other to engage in direct judicial communications, to send important judgments to INCADAT, this database, to participate in international seminars. And then we have the last chapter, which is the most important, I would say, which is how, how are we going to communicate on specific matters, uh, which are the communication safeguards, for instance, and one of them is that every judge who engages in judicial communications must respect his own law on jurisdiction. So it's, uh, we're not asking you to do something that you, are, you cannot do, but what I'm saying is sometimes you, what is not prohibited is allowed. If it's conform your principles, you should not wait that it is written in your law to do it, but of course it's, if it's prohibited, you should not do it, uh, if you understand me. So your independence must be um, safe guaranteed, so this it's not to speak about a case, about the substance, the merits of a case, we're not going to discuss or what you think of this mother and of this father and of what, what, what shall we do about this child. It's not the purpose. It's the purpose to speak just about how we can organize things. Um, I, I come later on, on what, what we are speaking about exactly. Um, the initiating of the communication, Martina explained very well yesterday that it's, it might be a bit difficult to say, okay, I take my telephone and I phone the judge of I don't know, blah, 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 which, which country. And I s start speaking about the case. No way, of course, you will say, no, who are you? I have no... So the initiating of the communication should go through this network judge so that you can recognize and be guaranteed that you are speaking with the person 
who is really a judge and who has been a little bit coached and briefed about okay what what is this part because when it's the first time you say how can I do that okay so do the Hague judges, the, the members of the network, can help the judges to enter into this communication. Um, mainly, I would say, when we speak about the, the form of the communications, uh, given also the language difficulties, is the, to use the most efficient form is the electronic form, the emails, because then you have a print, you have a, a trace of what is, has been discussed, and uh, you have also no problem with the time um, schedules. You can, you don't disturb the other one. The other one can answer when he has a uh, little time. So this is an advantage. You have also, you speak them. You try to find a common language, but if you don't have, you can go through English and ask the help of your Hig network, who will translate maybe if, if it's difficult for you. Uh, what else? So this is all written in here. You can have oral or, uh, communications, but you need always to have a report of what is being done. And uh, it is very important to have this print, this written report that you put in the file, because you have to give the occasion to the parties to, to give their opinion on it. You're not going just to do that behind the body, or the, behind the back of, of, your, of the parties. We have to respect our the rights of the defense and all that. So the best is that you, when you have parties at your hearing and you think that it would be useful to have more information from first hand from another judge, you speak about it with the parties. You say, okay, what do you think? I can do this, I can take contact with my hate judge and get in contact, it can be very quick. We can uh, schedule a new hearing and then we will see what has been the communication. So this is a very efficient way to do it. Um, okay. So what are those communications about? I would say scheduling of hearings, ensuring about the possibility of a quick hearing. I give a, a very easy example. I had a, a Belgian judge who contacted me because he wanted to uh, transfer a case under Article uh, 15, asked uh, a judge from France, from Bretagne, uh, to take a case because he thought this judge was better placed because the whole family, nobody was still in Belgium. When, when he was seized, the family lived in Belgium, but they were French citizens and after the divorce proceedings were started in Belgium, the mother moved to Bretagne and the father moved to Paris. So there was no link anymore with Belgium and he thought this, this Belgian, this French judge would be better placed. But he wanted to know uh, whether he would, this judge would accept first, but secondly, whether his, this judge would schedule very quickly a hearing because there were, it was urgent to take at least one measure. And he considered to make himself a provisional measure before transferring his, yes. his jurisdiction. But he wanted only to do that if, if, if it was not possible for the French judge to, to do it himself very quickly. So this kind of things you can discuss. Of course, you're not going to discuss about the merits of the case. Um, what else? Establish whether protective measures can are available for the child before you return a child. Um, ascertaining whether the foreign court has already made a decision or whether, the for, in a dependence case, whether the foreign court has already established his jurisdiction to know exactly when the foreign court has been seized to determine who is first seized and second seized. Also to uh, ascertain whether there are already social reports maybe or that. Uh, so it's not the good way to, to take evidence abroad. Okay, we've seen taking evidence abroad, you have to use the regulation or maybe the central authority, the mission of the central authority who will ask through the central authority to make a 
a report which will be maybe a police uh, ins inspection inquiry, very small. If you really want an expertise or a social report, you better use a European regulation on taking of evidence. But maybe there exists already, there is already a file in the other country and, and there are already things that exist. Why not ask whether that exists? And then you can ask the party to, to bring it to you or you can ask the judge to send it to you. Um, okay, um, these are examples. Enforcement. When there is a return case, uh, you are seized from the, re the request of return and parties agree, you, you, you made a mediation or whatever, you find a solution which is agreed with parties, which says that the child will return with abducting parents and that in the origin, state of origins, they will handle such and such and such. And they will make this kind of agreement. But of course, as, as a return judge, you are not in a power to act their agreement. So you can take a contact with the judge of the original state to ask whether such an agreement is something doable in his state, whether this is conform to the law of the state of origin, and whether this will be able to be uh, put in a judgment to have a uh, enforceable uh, text. All these kind of things which will so much reassure the people and they will feel that they are, you know, like in a coherent um, whole set of, of uh, professionals who are working together towards a solution. The, the worst thing in those international border cases is that first all family cases are emotionally heavy, but with the cross-border problematic on top of that, it makes it so un... Um, Impossible for people to, to feel what what is going on. The lawyers take everything and they, they go with all the legal stuff and people don't understand what's happening and they, they, they cannot really go further because you, you have all this cross-border matter that has to be solved before. And so when they feel that, uh, okay, they have to do with professionals who really are in contact and they are not doing whatever uh, they think to have to do and then in other country they, they, they just work with their own picture it will help really people settle to um, get more peaceful uh, situation I'm, I'm sure you you will achieve more agreements with this kind of work and you will prohibit lawyers to go all uh, procedural arguments and to make it worse with their fights, you know, legal fights, which are not which, which are not in the interest of each other. Okay, let's go on. Future work. Okay, there is this problem with the legal basis. What what uh, can we stand on? Um, two articles that I wrote there do speak about this communication. So. I think that we can do it. We have international instruments that speak about it, even if we don't have uh, national instruments. But I think in some states there are. But in, at least in Belgium we don't have. And so the Permanent Bureau is considering the, um, the opportunity of, and the feasibility of elaborating an international instrument to give this legal basis. But um, again, maybe we can do without. We can, uh, we, we can stand on general legal and constitutional order, on the consent of the parties, on, on the guidelines, on guidelines emanating from National Judicial Council, on the reliance on the implied obligations coming from our conventions. Um, and currently we have to encourage, encourage the designation of judges under the network to disseminate widely the guidelines and to raise awareness about this kind of way of work. Uh, okay. Now, I'm not going to speak to you more about cases because time is over, but maybe in a later, if we have time in the afternoon, we can, we can uh, give more examples. 
and this is the paper that I want you to fill out before the end of the day and I will help you to find the, the contacts of your uh, Hague judge because the, I have them here um, the names you can find them yourself on, on the internet but not the contacts uh, easy contact points you have them on the internet but okay come come uh, at my place and I, I'll find it with you um, that's it thank you Sorry, I forgot to tell you about this, the end of this story, maybe very quickly. So as I already uh, said, the judge uh, finally, uh, everything was blocked and at some stage uh, the, the mother here, the judge, the international the Hague judge, contacted me to tell me what is going on on hell in Belgium because everything, we cannot do anything, this, this is just stayed. The, the, the file is in the archives, and this judgment and this judge wants to to answer a lot of questions, which he, he should not, because you have understood that recognition responsibility is just put this European stamp and just look at the very little refusal grounds, but not review the substance. Um, and then, so I was contacted. I tried to. You know, to understand what was going on, and I, I found the both judges, and I told them. Of course, it's I'm not there to, to say, okay, now you have to do this and this and this. You know, every judge is independent and can do what he wants. But sometimes they're very happy to have somebody who can maybe clarify a little bit the legal framework. That's what I did on, to explain how it it's been. Well, to explain the, the big picture, I would say it like that. And then he understood this judge, he didn't want to um, enforce the judgment, the English judgment. He was really, he had something against the mother. And he f understood that he could refuse the enforceability because there was this exported judgment, which is a later judgment than the English one, um, and which was contradictory. Okay? So he refused. But then uh, we arranged that the case came back here in this uh, proceeding of opposition and this judge finally understood that she had no jurisdiction so she had not just to stay proceedings because stay proceedings make makes this permanent um, she had to annul of course this judgment and then to say i annul it and i have no jurisdiction so okay this is gone and th there the public ministry went in appeal and in appeal they could uh, uh, overturn it and um, give this enforceability with the consequence that everything could, that the child could go again with her mother. Okay, so it was a, an example of what you should not do. Thank you. Uh, we can have now our uh, coffee break for half an hour and then uh, we will listen uh, to Mrs. Uh, Pemoba after the, the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs>